FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. We're back on the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. And it is Friday. We're getting near the end. We got Jason Hartman with us. A lot to talk about because you've been hearing tales of the uh, death of the real estate market, which, uh, as a famous writer once said, are greatly exaggerated. Jason, how are you? Hey, good, Carrie. How are you? And uh, listen, I don't mind if we have a little bit of death of the real estate market. You know, that's that's okay with me. Uh, what what people always have to remember when they're investors is that income property is a multi-dimensional asset class. So if the market slows down, that means fewer people are buying. If fewer people are buying, they're faced with only three real choices, buy, rent, or be homeless. So, hey, you know, that's going to strengthen rents, and that's okay with me. I, I don't want people buying. <laughs> you know, I want them renting. Exactly. I'm an investor. Yeah. Exactly. You know, well, I think what's happened here, Jason, is there's like, there's several markets always in the real estate market. There's people who are buying to live in these homes, upgrade markets, first timers, and then there's investors. So the investor market, I think, is probably doing okay. But what you've got is the middle class market that needs mortgages. And what happened is that uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Board and uh, the FHFA, um, strengthened the rules for obtaining a mortgage. Like for instance, there's now a measure in there called ability to repay. And you need to have in your bank account, roughly six months of debt service in order to qualify for a mortgage. So what's happened is it's harder for middle-class borrowers to qualify for a mortgage. And not that this is necessarily a bad thing, but what it's done is it shrunk the pool of potential buyers in the middle class level of the home market. And now all of a sudden, what you see is the FHFA and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau are panicking. And what you're going to see in the next six months, I predict this, and I'm writing an article about it now, is they're going to go way, way, way in the other direction. And proof of this is that Ditech Mortgage is coming back, and they were emblematic of the heady days of the mortgage meltdown, pre-mortgage meltdown. And they're coming back under new ownership. Remember, lost another one to Ditech. Yeah, ah. I, I, can't, I can't wait to be yeah. flooded with all those commercials again. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to go way in the other direction. I don't know that you'll have 125% uh, take money off the table mortgages, but I think that they're going to open the floodgates of mortgage credit because all, let's face it, all this administration really cares about, Jason, is perception. And if the housing market looks like it's going down, they will juice it up to make make it look like it's healthy. And if there's added defaults and another housing bust part deux, that'll be the next guy's problem. And they just really don't care about it, Right. Yeah, you know, it's always uh, kick the can down the road. That's pretty much the American mentality, unfortunately. And uh, and this administration, the Obama regime, is all into appearances. And, uh, you know, they're, they're like the biggest PR firm on the planet, the Obama clan. Uh, you know, it's just all about appearances. You know, put a Band-Aid over something, make it look healthy when it's really not, and let the next guy discover all the, uh, you know, pay for all the consequences uh, later, you know, so. Yeah, that's it. That's yep. it. And that's uh, what we have to look forward to. And you're going to see that you mark my words. They're already cutting back on. There's a whole bunch of technical things in the mortgage market that they've changed. And really, Jason, you know, and I know that the only way to fix the housing market in the long run is to get the government out of it. They had no business being in the housing market in the first place just like they have no business being in any other market. And the best thing they can do is just to get their damn nose 
out of it. Right. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We've written and talked on my show, The Creating Wealth Show, extensively, Carrie, about uh, the possibility of Fannie Mae going out of business like it should. Mm -hmm. And most real estate people, you know, this is kind of counterintuitive. Most real estate people just really kind of don't get it. OK. And, um, you know, initially, if Fannie Mae went away, that would definitely put downward pressure on housing prices. Of course. But. The, the amateur investor believes it's all about price. The sophisticated investor understands that income property is a multi-dimensional asset class. And what we're in the game for is buy and hold investing. We're here to produce yield, to produce cash flow from our investments. Very conservative strategy. So appreciation, you know, hey, it's icing on the cake. It's fine when it happens. But we certainly do not invest for it. We invest for cash flow, which is pretty darn reliable. And if Fannie Mae were to go out of business, I mean, that would be phenomenal. I mean, the, the, the sales rate would go way down, yet the population continues to increase. And people need housing because they have only those three choices I mentioned earlier. They can buy, they can rent, or they can be homeless. And uh, that, that would totally strengthen the rental markets. I mean, rents would ultimately skyrocket if Fannie Mae were to go away, if the government were to get its nose out of the business, I think it'd be awesome. And now initially, you know, for the adjustment period of maybe a year or two, people would freak out and go, oh my God, this is the end of the world. But why should there be a Fannie Mae? I mean, conceptually, you know, what, what is the government doing propping up housing? It's, it's, a fake, uh, it, it, it's a fake influence on the market. And the same has happened in the, in the business of student loans and oh. colleges. And that's why college costs have gone up at, you know, two, three, four times the rate of inflation for the last couple of decades. It's absurdity, okay? You know, I, I don't mind if housing becomes a little bit less expensive and, uh, and, and then we have the market equalized to the true free market price. But mm -hmm. I tell you, that's going to cause rent prices to go through the roof. It's going to be great for investors that are into the buy and hold business like me. Two things would happen. One, the prices would go down. Two, interest rates would go up. Oh, they go way up. Because and, they'd be risk adjusted. Yeah, risk, right. that little four letter word that doesn't seem to exist anymore. Well, you know what? If you're a subprime borrower, your rate might go up to 16%. But you know what? That's as it should be. Yeah. the Your price, the average price of the house now is what, 200 something thousand? Yeah, you know, the, the housing prices would definitely come down. I mean, yeah. if Fannie Mae were to go away, you know, probably if, if it ever were to go away, it would go away slowly. It would be a phase, phase out. Phase out you know, has not to just be. A, yeah. Um, but, uh, but that would ultimately be a shock to housing prices. Housing prices would drop by probably, uh, you know, 20, 30%. As they should. They should be dictated by the free market. Why should they be propped up by this fake, uh, you know, institution that, that prints money to create a false price level in the marketplace? It's, it's just silly. But rents would skyrocket. I mean, do you know what would happen to the income for investors if Fannie Mae were to go away? We did a speech at uh, my Meet the Masters event a few years ago, and it was entitled six years, six million new renters. And uh, basically what we did is we did this deep, big analysis that shows that, uh, you know, and these are, of course, approximations and predictions, admittedly, but it basically shows that for every 1% uptick in interest rates, that brings a million new renters into the rental market because they, you know, fewer people can buy. This is the multidimensional nature of income property. And if Fannie Mae were to go away, we think we could see as many as 20 million, get, really get your head around that, 20 million new renters ultimately. Now, you know, that's not going to happen overnight, but ultimately that would be the direction of the market where we'd have a lot more of a rental economy. I mean, why the heck should the homeownership rate be anywhere between 62 and 69%. You know, George Bush and his whole ownership society. I mean, it sounds good in a speech. Uh, you know, conceptually, there are a lot of studies saying that, you know, when people own their home, they're more rooted, they're more stable, they take better care of their neighborhoods. And, you know, I agree. I think that's all true. But really, 
you have to realize that when we have a really anemic market for employment, as we do and as we probably will continue to do as the economy is just changing so much, and some of this is structural and some of it is really okay because it's just a different world in which we live, but a lot of it is due to bad government policy too. So whatever the reason, the employment and the job market is anemic. We would all agree with that, I think. Oh, sure. And uh, probably will be for many years to come. The best thing, Kerry, that someone can have on their resume is mobility. Mm-hmm. The ability to move to where the jobs are. And if you're stuck with a house, you've got a, you've got a plan, you've got to take months, maybe years to sell it. Uh, you know, who knows? And, uh, you, you know, it's just a whole process. Why not just you know, lease your house and be like, uh, you know, when I go to another city, when I go on a business trip, when I go on a vacation, I stay in a hotel. And I love the fact that these hotels are here to give me temporary housing. It's super convenient. You know, there was a time before Holiday Inn when there really wasn't much of a hotel industry at all. Okay. You know, people would drive across the country in America in the 40s and 50s and you know, there wasn't much in the way of hotels yeah. until Holiday Inn really changed yeah, that whole industry. Flea bags, a bunch of yeah, flea yeah. bags that could cost you your life to stay in. Right, and people would camp. You know, they would camp uh, when they would do these long road trips or or when they would make a move west. They, they would just camp. I mean, you know, you've read The Grapes of Wrath, okay? <laughs> that's uh, uh, yeah. and that's then the you way had it used to be. Old-style hotels in urban areas located near train stations. Exactly. So uh, I, I remember that Lucille Ball episode. I mean, that was awesome <laughs> when the train came by and the bed would move. Across yeah. <laughs> you reminded me uh, of that. My cousin Vinny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my cousin Vinny. What an awesome movie. I just recently watched that one again. Yeah. And hilarious. That was great. But, so. but, you know, so what we should think about is positioning ourselves to provide housing to people who seek mobility, the best thing you can have on a resume. We should be in a position... I mean, you know, we can make nicely and comfortably nowadays 15, 20, 25 percent annually as a return on our investment with Mm -hmm. prudent income property in the right markets where you get cash flow. And those markets are not the Socialist Republic of California. Mm -hmm. They're not Miami. Okay, they're not anywhere in the Northeast. Anywhere that's expensive just doesn't work. You know, we like. $100,000 $100,000 houses on average that rent for $1,000 a month. That equation works. Buying a property in Southern, Southern California, where I've lived almost all my life, I now live in Phoenix, uh, but you know, there you'll spend $500,000 for a property that only rents for $2,300 a month. That's a terrible deal. That's an idiot's game. That's someone who's investing for appreciation, which may never happen. If it does, hey, it's icing on the cake. But we want 1% per month is our target. And we may not get it. We may get 0.9. You know, the $100,000 house might rent for 900. That's okay. It's within reason. The the $100,000 house might rent for 1100. We'll get better than 1%, 1.1. But 1% per month, that's the general rule of thumb. It's the guideline, okay? Right. That is a property that makes sense. That is a property that's going to give you a yield every year, okay, of about 15 to 20 or 25% annually. And I always say, even if it only goes half as well as predicted or expected, so what? You're going to make what? Half? You're going to make 10% annually? Where else are you going to do that reliably and consistently? Income property is the most historically proven asset class in America. There, there's there's just no competitor. And stay out of Detroit because uh, right now there's 40,000 buildings. <laughs> I love and, it. And you, know, yeah. you know what's amazing? It's going to cost a billion dollars to knock down 40,000 buildings, which is $25,000 a building. And, I mean, it's mind-boggling here. It is mind-boggling. Jason. I mean, yeah. $25,000 a building. I mean, you know, 
where who are the people knocking these freaking buildings down well they're Jason. they're overpaid uh lazy <laughs> union members uh that, with these corrupt unions uh and they are uh, they're just overcharging but detroit is the poster child and but we've never recommended detroit i mean it's the poster child for why big government doesn't work i mean detroit is literally the biggest disaster uh, of big government it's, yeah. it's just absurd it's its I mean, logical why conclusion it, why, no, why it's, isn't it's not every, a disaster. It's its logical conclusion of, of big government. Yeah, of course. Big government does not work. It never has. It never will. But why aren't the environmentalists, why aren't the leftist environmental wackos out in force <laughs> about the massive waste going on in, in Detroit? I mean, wasting these assets, wasting 40,000 homes when we have homeless people. That that's unbelievable. I mean, that just should. It's just absurd. You know, not all of these houses are are decrepit. You know, yeah. some are, but uh, they could be fixed. They could be, you know, if if free enterprise was allowed to really work, if the government would get out of the way and um, and and they they'd stop backing up the unions that have chased all the businesses out of Detroit. I mean, Detroit used to be one of the flagship cities of the entire planet carry i know i mean it was it was certainly one of america's flagship cities the wealthiest the population city. has been cut in half it, it it's it's a disaster it's an absolute disaster so no the markets we like we like atlanta we like memphis and you know memphis is not a great you know area per se but it's the logistics capital of the country it's where FedEx. tons of blue collar workers have forty thousand dollar a year jobs and they make fantastic renters and those logistics companies like FedEx, they're not going anywhere, okay? Yeah. Uh, they're not relocating. It's just too hard to relocate them. No. So uh, we like uh, Memphis, we so like Houston. Right. And, you know, one other thing. It's a no-income tax state. Yep. It's a, uh, what was I going to say? It's a, I think it's a right-to-work state, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, all the right-to-work states are doing so much better than the union states that say you have to join a union to get a job. I mean, yeah. that is so discriminatory. It's unbelievable. All right. So let's go to Indiana. Any good markets in Indiana? We like Indianapolis. You know, that has been, Carrie, a perennial favorite of ours. Uh, I've been recommending Indianapolis for the past eight years. And we've had a lot of investors, hundreds of them, do very well in Indianapolis. There's nothing exciting about it. Uh, you know, it's a pretty boring place. We like boring. Uh, we, we like boring. We like the markets that don't make the news. If they're in the headlines, if they're a high flying market, like California type markets, like mm -hmm. South Florida, um, you know, like Northeastern expensive markets, New York, uh, you know, Boston, Connecticut, you know, sure. all these types of places. I mean, these, these places do not work. The properties are just way too expensive. So, uh, you know, our investors are building nationwide portfolios where they're investing in and in diversifying into multiple markets. You know, they'll buy three properties in Houston. They'll buy three in Memphis. They'll buy three in Atlanta. And there you've got a little mini portfolio of nine properties, okay? We've got people that are buying 40, 50, 60 properties. Um, you know, we, got, we have clients that buy one or two, and they just do it real slowly. Mm -hmm. Wherever you are on that scale, just um, sensible, logical, logical income property where you don't invest for appreciation. The, the property makes sense the day you buy it. That's, that's where you need to be thinking. So I know I've asked you this question before, Jason, but um, as far as like a uh, duplex or a quadplex um, as opposed to a one family, I know you uh, you go both ways on that. Yeah, yeah, I kind of do. And here, here's the reason. Um, I have, have owned or currently own them all, okay? I'm involved in apartment deals, uh, my largest one being uh, 125 units in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, I, I'm in that one with a, a client partner, and uh, I just sold another one of mine that's a small 11-unit complex. I've got a 10-unit complex. I've got a bunch of single-family homes, and then I've had fourplexes. You know, uh, you know, you can do duplexes, you can do triplexes. 
all of this stuff, it really varies depending on the area. But I'll tell you, the single family home is the most tried and true asset class. Mm -hmm. It's really simple. It it just works. And you get a higher quality tenant in a single family home than you do in multiple units. Certainly you can make a lot of money in multi-units. Fourplexes can be great. But, uh, you know, it just depends on the area. It depends on your style of uh, interest in terms of, you know, what kind of tenant quality do you want? And again, our investors don't deal with tenants. They use managers. We we screen and recommend property managers to our clients. And, and we exert a lot of leverage over those property managers because we aggregate all the business of thousands of clients across our network. And we give these property managers so much business that, you know, I, I always joke and I say, when, they, when we say jump, they say how high, because they're, they're getting a lot of business from us. So, so, you know, when you're a client of our network, you matter. It's not like you're a small account. You're part of a big account. Because even if you only have one property with that property manager, you have the aggregate value of all of the clients in our network who are with that manager. And if that manager does something wrong or if they do a bad job, the word gets around our network very, very quickly. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so that is, um, that's an important aspect. Sure. Um, Good thing. But, uh, but, but yeah, you know, so the single family, to answer your question, the single family home will generally give you the nicest, highest tenant quality. It'll give you the longest term tenants. My mother has a single family home uh, and she has several of them. She only does single family uh, where the tenant has been there, Carrie. I mean, this is unbelievable what I'm about to say. The tenant has been there since 1989. Wow. <laughs> My goodness, that's a, that's yeah. twenty five years. Yeah, isn't that amazing? The tenant Jeez. could have simply he's a truck could have driver. Bought the place. He's, he's a truck driver. He's a great tenant. He's uh, got a wife and a dog, and they live in this property. She has never changed the carpet in twenty five years. Jeez. Not to say she's a slumlord or anything. He hasn't asked. Um, mm-hmm. The guy does his own repair work. He treats it like it's his own home. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. you, you're just not going to get that in an apartment or a fourplex. Yeah. Um, but usually, here's the advantage of the apartment or fourplex. Usually your rent-to-value ratios are a little bit higher. They're a little bit better. Um, but in terms of appreciation and tenant quality, nothing's going to beat a single-family home on, uh, on average. That's the, that's the best one. It sounds like an even better investment than a college education, huh? Oh, that's for sure. College, college is, uh, has really become overrated. And, you know, it's not overrated if it's not a liberal arts degree. I mean, if someone's doing engineering or, well, medicine's getting destroyed by Obamacare, but, you know, if it yeah. doesn't get totally destroyed and the opportunity doesn't go away, thank mm-hmm. you, Obama. Um, you know, medicine, I mean, something that's real that people actually need, you know. Uh, no, nobody's hiring, so far as I know, for feminist studies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anything that ends with studies, uh, yeah, it's pretty right. much any degree with studies makes you pretty much unemployable, right? Yeah. Listen, I love the I love the subject of philosophy, right? But nobody's hiring philosophy majors. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, psychology majors. You know, if I had a nickel for every psychology major I have hired over the years, <laughs> it's just like these people don't use their degrees. It's just it's just mm-hmm. wasteful. It's it's silly. Um, college is, uh, you know, thanks to the government, just like Fannie Mae, as we started our conversation with today, college ha- is an artificial market. It's priced artificially high. If the government would stop insuring student loans, if they'd stop doing Pell Grants and all this crap and all this government interference in the marketplace, college tuition would drop like a rock. It would be priced where it should be. And people could go to college as my mother did in the 60s, she went to Berkeley and worked her way through college, okay? Uh, you know, and, and Berkeley is like, you know, one of the best schools in the country, right? And uh, you, even though it's, you know, leftist, okay? <laughs> but yeah. but in the, I tell you, in the 60s when my mom went to Berkeley before the, 
real, you know, of a liberal side. You know, she was in the earlier 60s. And, um, uh, you know, she was reading The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and, and every, and I said, why didn't you read those books? You know, I mean, you were going to Berkeley in the 60s. And she said, you know, Jason, that's just what everybody was carrying around. Everybody was carrying around a copy of Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead. We were all talking about it. That's what everybody was reading. I'm like, mm -hmm. really? That's phenomenal. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about time that somebody learned something in that place, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Because but, uh, uh, they sure haven't been teaching much of anything uh, for the past generation. And yeah. that's why college has become less and less worthwhile an endeavor unless you're actually learning one of the STEM disciplines. And even them recently read an article there's too many STEM degree people mm -hmm. out on the streets now as well. Yep. So unless you're a petroleum engineer or a mining engineer, and even mining engineers with the depressed state of the mining industry are in too great a supply. So, so special thanks to our main supporter here, Jason Hartman. Jason, just tell us where we find you and your podcasts and all your media publications. Yeah. Uh, jasonhartman.com. That's jasonhartman.com. And my, uh, my top podcast, I have a bunch of them, but my uh, most popular one is called the creating wealth show. Uh, we've got about 5 million people have downloaded that show over the years and, uh, that you can find at jasonhartman.com or on iTunes or on Stitcher radio and just, uh, search my name in the iTunes store, Jason Hartman. And, uh, and that's H A R T M A N. So Jason Hartman.com and Carrie, uh, Ooh, we got a giveaway too. Yeah, that we forgot yeah, you, about you, you always, Ooh, you always get save me the best to for give, last. a little giveaway uh, for your listeners. So Carrie's very good like that. Do you do that to your other guests? Sure. Okay. Good. We're always yeah. hitting people up for something for you out there. Always. Good. Well, yeah. So the giveaway is, uh, we have an event coming up in Southern California uh, beautiful Southern California, great place to visit, not a good place to live. <laughs> yeah, especially uh, you know, not now. Over Overtaxed and overrated, in my opinion, but I lived there for many, many years. And um, this is in Irvine, California, which is in Orange County, the OC. And it's on June 28th. It's our most popular event. Uh, I've had probably, oh gosh, I've probably taught this course to maybe eight, 9,000 people over the years. And uh and it's called Creating Wealth in Today's Economy. We'll teach you how to really, really invest. And uh, Carrie twisted my arm and asked me to give away free tickets. And a ticket is for two people. So that means you can bring your spouse or significant other. And they're free. And uh, that's for the first 10 people that uh, request one at jasonhartman.com slash Lutz, L-U-T-Z. Uh, Carrie's last name. So jasonhartman.com slash Lutz, L-U-T-Z, and uh, get yourself a free ticket. All right. So there it is. Get yourself a free ticket, jasonhartman.com slash Lutz. And Jason, we'll talk to you in a little while. You be well. Hey, hey Carrie, one more thing I should mention for uh, people from out of town visiting. We got a great hotel block deal uh, at Hotel Irvine, where the event is, which is uh, formerly the Hyatt Regency Irvine. It's a gorgeous hotel. $99 a night for the rooms. So, uh, you know, you can't miss. I mean, this is a great way to take a little Southern California vacation and, and get a really inexpensive, uh, very nice hotel room and uh, also get some great education. All right. Excellent. All right. JasonHartman.com slash Lutz. Yeah. All right, Jason. Until then, we'll talk to you soon. Happy investing. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.